Hello, world. And uh, what's your name? Sam Branham. Now, I have stumbled upon you, and you happen to be reading uh, Dr. Temple's uh, book, um, The Autistic Brain. Now, Temple Grandin is following me on Twitter, which makes me really happy. And like me, Temple Grandin is high-functioning, autistic, and um, I want to ask, um, what does she talk about in her book? She's talking about the autistic brain and helping people to understand that a lot of the behaviors that they see stem specifically from areas of the brain that they can now light up, and she's helping to shape the way we view autism and the way it's treated and the way it's diagnosed. And she get away from labels. Yeah, that's really, really smart, you know? I mean, they, they do the labeling too much. I mean, basically, when I was a kid, they said I would, they pigeonholed me as low-functioning because I had, quote, autism. I mean, they said when I was a kid, I would never do this and never do that. I mean, I mean, they just basically, they labeled me, and then they basically said I had some sort of mental illness called hypomania when I got diagnosed with my Asperger's syndrome, so. But, so, why are, so you said you're doing a bunch of research on autism. What's the main core for that? I'm a pediatric occupational therapist, so a lot of the children I treat have autism or are on the spectrum. So I figure the more I read, especially about, especially authors that have autism, the better I can understand why behaviors happen and how parents understand why their kids do the things they do based on other people's first-hand knowledge. So, um, so are you mainly reading Dr. Temple Grand and stuff, or? I read everything I can find written by anybody with autism. Uh, so who have, you, who have you read about so far? I've read Donna Williams' book, and I can't name all the authors, but through the years, I've been a therapist now for over 15 years, so a lot of books and a lot of time. <laughs> so, is it true that when Temple Grandin was younger, uh, she, you know, you could put, when she got her PhD and she'd stand before la a mass amount of people, you couldn't even clap your hands because it would affect her? That's what she said. She was highly sensitive to hearing and clap. Because I heard when I was a kid that Dr. Temple Grandin couldn't handle a crowd clapping when she you know, when she does her stuff. I mean, it was some, it's some autistic like her that has a PhD and you cannot clap because it affects them. I don't know if it's Temple. I don't know. I can't somebody. remember, but I know she had a lot of sensitivities that she's learned to to uh, cope with. Yeah. Have you seen her movie, uh, with, uh, the HBO special? Nope, I just saw that in her book, so that's my next thing to watch. Yeah, Claire Danes plays her very, very well. Um, personally, I don't, I don't know why they picked Claire Danes for the roles. She looks nothing like Dr. Grandin, even when she was younger. So, I think Temple has a very unique look. But, yeah, I basically had asked her last year at what she thought about, because she, she's all about early intervention, and she's all about, um, I mean, she's all about early intervention, and she's all about kids learning at a young age. And I told her that, for me, I, I didn't learn my social skills and uh, my therapies until I, I hit my 20s. And I told her about the, ma where did she stand about the te people in their 20s? is earning ma learning math and at the age of 21 and she got she got really blunt and she goes so big deal you learn math at 21 <laughs> and then she goes um, you don't need to worry about that just because you're autistic doesn't mean your mind isn't going to stop growing so she said that I make I made mistakes too and she talked about one of her lectures she said, you, your mind is going to keep growing you know um, that's real common for someone with autism that's what they're teaching neuroplasticity that the brain just continues to lay new patterns in anything that you learn because uh, back when I was a kid, they said that they have, you know, my, my IQ was in the lower averages, and uh, the, teach, the teacher who was a, a, quote, autistic specialist said that my IQ would never grow during one of my IEP meetings at age 17, and she said, and I wanted to slap her. I mean, I knew in my heart that was a lie. But, but anyway, so, um, so you're a, so what kind of therapy do you do with, uh, with your children? Are you ABA, or what are you doing? Um, I'm kind of very non-traditional pediatric OT because I was trained by physical therapists in my early years of working, so I do a lot of neurodevelopmental treatment which has to do with handling and teaching the body to connect to the earth prior to learning, so I feel like a lot of kids with autism don't have a connection of where they are in space. So what age 
ages do you work with the kids? Um, it's really any age all the way up to adulthood. So, but so right now my youngest will be and my caseload is just two. Two years old and how is he? He's a cutie pie. A cutie pie? He probably be considered high functioning and he's learning his words now and he's learning to do things fine but he's made major gains in his body just kind of learning how to move and learning how to connect and his gross motor is just taking off and in that case now his fine motor is following suit so it's really great. So what do you do in your occupational therapy? Usually my first treatment is uh, kind of getting them grounded and centered and we do a lot of deep pressure and lotion and fun activities and a lot of proprioceptive input through wheelbarrow walking and getting them engaged. So my whole point is to try to keep them engaged with me and keep them wanting to do more things with me and build them up on one thing to the next. We do obstacle courses so that they can learn their motor skills and uh, teaching parents how to have fun with their children just because they're autistic and they don't play like other kids doesn't mean that they don't want to play. So teaching, teaching parents to get down on the floor with their kids, roll around, keep them involved. Yeah, that's what they do in Japan. They play with their kids. It's uh, you know, uh, you know, they, you know, the nature versus nurture. Yeah. From what I, you know, what I read in one of my psychology courses back when I went to Georgia Perimeter College, I took a psychology of human development, and they said that in Japan, the, uh, the you know, the, the mothers and fathers play with their children. So that's very good. Um, yeah, it's I like the, to see the parents for the first time enjoying their kids and their children seeking them out for play rather than as a tool or for food. And it's just this amazing connection that happens when you see a mother and child just laughing together for the sheer joy of play. That is wonderful. So I'm curious, what's the name of your therapy center? Well, I work at um, Speech Therapy of Forsyth. So I actually work with speech therapists and we found that when speech and OT work together, there's really tremendous carryover for the language to take off and the kids are grounded. Do you know if they have programs like this for adults? I know that uh, that occupational therapy goes into adulthood, so I suppose if you were going to uh, to a center, they could definitely treat adults. Yeah. Because that, that'd be really interesting. I would love to try try the type of therapy that you're talking about, just to see it, just to see how it would work, and maybe experiment around. It'd be great with someone like you, is you'd be able to tell them what you feel, what's changing, what makes a difference, and that would be amazing. All right. Well, your name is Joanna, right? Suzanne. Brown. Suzanne. Well, it was nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs>